My name is Todd Beck, and I'm a web seminar producer for ACAMS. Welcome to the ACAMS web seminar, Financial Warfare, a conversation with national security expert Juan Zatari. Zarate, excuse me, Juan. No our moderators not. today, our moderator today will be John Byrne and Kieran Beer. John is Executive Vice President of ACAMS. He's a nationally known regulatory and legislative attorney with close to 30 years of experience in a vast array of financial services issues with particular expertise in all aspects of regulatory oversight, policy and management, anti-money laundering, privacy, and consumer compliance. John's written over 100 articles on AML representing the banking industry in this area before Congress, state legislatures, and international bodies such as the Financial Action Task Force, and he appeared on CNN, Good Morning America, The Today Show, and many other media outlets. John has received a number of awards from FinCEN, the ABA, and others, and is certainly a familiar face to those who have gone to our conferences and seen him speak elsewhere. John, I'll turn it over to you and let you introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, thank you, Todd, and uh, let me also add our apologies for the technical glitch there. I also want to make sure that we uh, remember and we're pleased to have as a sponsor FinScan, and they've done a tremendous amount of work with ACAMS, and we really appreciate them making this webinar possible today. Before I introduce our guest, uh, I do also want to mention, obviously, as Todd just did, Kieran Beer, the editor-in-chief of ACAMS MoneyLaundering.com, extensive experience in uh, banking and, obviously, AML and financial crime, who will be joining me as co-moderator but before I do that, uh, I do want to take a moment to remember an AML hero that passed away on Sunday. Uh, Cameron Kip Holmes was a visionary whose use of state and federal asset forfeiture laws gave law enforcement a dramatic tool in combating all forms of money laundering, and he left us way, way too early on Sunday. Uh, for more information, please check out today's ACAMS Connection for information about Kip, and I just wanted to make sure that we did that. As I mentioned, joining, my colleague, joining with me today is my colleague, Kieran Beer. Um, we are really very, very excited about today's program on a number of levels. Uh, Juan Zarate, as we all know, is a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the senior national security analyst for CBS News, and he's a visiting lecturer of law at Harvard Law School. Prior to that, Juan served as the deputy assistant to the president, deputy national security advisor for combating terrorism, and the first ever Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Terrorist Financing and Financial Crime. I think many of you know he appears frequently on CBS News programs, PBS's NewsHour, NPR, CNN, and has written for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and more. Today, there's a couple things we want to do with Juan. First, we want to get some background and uh, some detail regarding his excellent book, Treasury's War, The Unleashing of a New Era of Financial Warfare, a uh, book that uh, Kieran and I were fortunate enough to have been able to read over the course of the past month and uh, talk to Juan a bit about the book, but also, more importantly, his vision for using financial activity to go after terrorist act actions throughout the world and, and how he sees what's happened before, but also next, next steps. There's a lot to talk to Juan about, but Juan, if I could, what I'd like to do is start off with a broad-based question. It's actually a two-parter. One is the reasons behind you writing the book, and then also um, before I turn it to Kieran for some questions, I'm particularly interested in the first section of the book where you walk us through 9-11 and right after that and maybe give us some sense of the behind-the-scenes challenges and things that you were involved in at that point. But once again, Juan, thanks so much for joining us today and uh, really appreciate your time. John, it's, it's my honor and pleasure to be with you. I really um, was excited when uh, you extended the invitation to me, and I want to thank you and Kieran for all the work that you've done. The fact that you read the book is great, uh, and Todd for all his help, and the technical issues were on my side, so I apologize to the listeners. But I, I'm really excited to, to be with you today uh, and to talk to the community that cares uh, deeply about um, the anti-money laundering system and, frankly, the use of financial tools uh, and enforcement mechanisms in issues not just related to financial crime, but uh, broader national security issues. Um, John, I, I wrote this book for two main reasons. The first is uh, there is no question that the use of financial power and influence has taken pride of place in our national security. Um, this isn't just the province anymore of 
uh, bank experts uh, or specialists. It's not just the province of DOJ prosecutors or uh, state authorities or even regulators. The issues that, that this community has cared deeply about for decades now form part of a national security doctrine. Um, and one need only look at the, the headlines to understand that. The New York Times yesterday had two top-of-the-fold uh, front-page stories. One, the effect of economic pressure uh, and sanctions on Iran and the role that that's playing on, uh, on the, the debate over their nuclear program and the diplomacy. The other, uh, the, sh the shifts and complexities of the Al-Shabaab financial uh, network in, in the wake of the Nairobi attacks and understanding not only how they raise money, but um, how we go about countering it. And so there's no question that these issues are uh, front and center in our national debate in terms of national security and the integrity of the financial system. And I wanted to explain that to readers who may not be as astute as uh, those who are part of the ACAMS network and to a broader um, broader set of readers to understand how this has evolved and why it's important to understand. The second reason was I wanted to tell what I think to be a fairly interesting and fun story about the people and the community that was involved, especially in the post-9-11 environment, in shaping and reshaping how these uh, authorities and strategies were thought about. Folks like Danny Glazer, Stuart Levy, David Offhauser, Rick Newcomb, the, the names that you all know well, um, I wanted to sort of put them in historical context and, and also tell the story of the institutional changes at Treasury. Uh, because as, as I like to say, uh, there were times, especially in the, in the difficult days of the transition to Homeland Security in 2002, 2003, where I would be asked as the Treasury representative in meetings at the White House, why is the Treasury here? They don't belong here. Uh, whereas by the time I left uh, my post at the White House, in 2009, the question in the Situation Room in the Oval Office was, where is Treasury and why isn't Treasury here? And I wanted to tell the story of that evolution, the story of the people who were behind that and also the institutional change, which is, I think, known to, to many of the listeners on this call, but not well known, frankly, even within the U.S. government beyond certain circles. So those were the, those were the two primary reasons why I wanted to tell the story and why I wrote the book. Hey, Juan, if I could, just a couple things. We've shown, and I'll, and I'll go back to it in a bit, we've shown a slide where uh, registrants today can get a, a discount off uh, the sale of the book, and, uh, you, and I'll put that up again in a little bit. We also, for slides today, are using basically the chapter uh, titles as jumping off points, and, and obviously we're not going to go through the entire book, but we are going to go through the key passages. Going back to um, my original two-parter is um, on 9-11 itself. Yeah. Give us a sense from a, from a government uh, standpoint in terms of your involvement that day and maybe a little bit, and I know Karen will have questions about the Patriot Act, and then I do want to go back to your comments on Homeland Security and how that impacted Treasury and what you folks had to do, as you say, to be relevant, and I think that's additionally very, very uh, compelling uh, reporting that you've done in the book, but give us a sense on the day of the attacks and right thereafter the decisioning that went into looking at the financial part of this, but also maybe some of the, if you can, the personal stories of that day and the, and the immediate aftermath. Sure. Uh, you know, 9-11 obviously was a tragic and dramatic day. Um, I had just joined the Treasury Department three weeks before uh, I had been a, a federal prosecutor in the terrorism and violent crime section. I uh, worked on some terrorism cases and, and a variety of other cases, uh, but had just arrived at Treasury, had a, an office on the fourth floor facing south, um, and as that day unfolded, as the attacks uh, happened that morning, um, realized very quickly, actually as I got on the phone with um, friends like George Toskis at DOJ and Jim Reynolds, who used to run the, the, he was the section chief at TVCS, to talk about what was happening, because it was it was clear to us, especially those of us who had looked at al-Qaeda cases before, and I'd worked on the USS Cole case, I'd been brought in to do some um, some very basic work uh, in the embassy bombings case with Pat Fitzgerald. So it was clear, clear to us, you know, who had been working on al-Qaeda cases, that we, you know, we were we were looking at something significant, likely an al-Qaeda strike, 
and very clearly that the war that had been happening overseas, you know, had had been joined and that they had attacked us. And I remember being on the phone um, with Jim Reynolds, actually, and we were talking about the various rumors of, of things that were happening. And, and if you recall that day, there was a rumor of a, a, a bombing at the State Department as well. There were concerns that the FBI was going to get hit, certainly questions as whether or not the White House and Congress were, were, were uh, targets as well. Um, and he also said, you know, we've heard that the Pentagon's been hit. And I remember looking south over the Potomac and seeing the black smoke uh, rising uh, from the Pentagon. And I remember saying, you know, I remember this like it's yesterday, saying, Jim, that, that's not a rumor. I'm, I, I can see it from here. If, you know, the Pentagon's been hit. And, and just this, sort of the stark reality of the fact that we were at war, I think, shook us all. Um, and certainly in the days after, reframed how we were thinking about our jobs and our role. And it was, it was clear from the moment that we you know, evacuated the, the Treasury Department, and we actually, a small group of us, went to the Secret Service headquarters uh, to monitor what was happening, uh, it was clear that we were go going to have to think creatively and differently and aggressively about how we used whatever authorities we had at our command or new authorities that, that were you know, legal and constitutional to bring to bear to deal with this problem and, and to uh, attack, in particular, terrorism and terrorist financing. Uh, and so the, the days that followed were really days of, um, uh, you know, a great deal of fear, because recall that we didn't quite know what was coming next, uh, a great deal of anxiety about needing to get in front of the next attack and to prevent it, um, and in particular fashioning uh, the tools that we would need to go after terrorist financing, both in terms of stopping the next attack, but also dismantling the networks that had historically provided uh, financial backing for Al Qaeda, and that that's what led uh, to what President Bush called the first first uh, step uh, to counter uh, the attacks on 9/11, which was the signing of Executive Order 13224, published on September 24, 2001, which was the first step taken officially by the U.S. government in response. And interestingly, that was the the executive order, as many of those on the call know, that expanded and deepened the power of the Secretary of Treasury to freeze the assets of not just terrorists or terrorist groups, but those that were providing support, financial facilitation, and those otherwise associated, which broadened uh, the potential target set. And in many ways, that started the Treasury on its path to use its tools and its authorities to identify those who should be frozen out of the financial system and an attempt to uh, you know, dismantle and deter uh, terrorist financing moving forward. Well, I'm, you know, um, I found the book uh, really interesting. Uh, those of you out there who are involved in sanctions or involved in uh, AML and CFT compliance, um, you know, this is all, this, this, it was a fascinating history of how we got to where we are uh, with someone who was largely at the table for so many of those meetings. And I think, you know, this thing that you're hitting on, of, you know, trying to find new tools, um, you know, I'd ask you to be maybe a little bit specific about some of the things, in fact, that you found as tools uh, that Treasury could use. And particularly in light of you alluded to it in the beginning, you know, basically post 9-11, all of the, all the guys with guns got stripped out of Treasury, to, or, or most of them. And uh, I think there was a real crisis about how you would participate uh, in the war on terror. And that in, in the face of that, there was this realization, wait a minute, we have all the links to um, central bankers. We have all the links to you know, finance ministries throughout the world. Uh, and also this amazing flow of financial information. So, you know, without getting too bogged down in history, I think it, it's fascinating to realize where we've come that you guys at that point in a number of steps seized on that, re that other reality, that you could be instrumental no, Karen, that, that's a, a good set of questions, and I, and I think it's important to recognize, and, and I try to do this in the book, that uh, there is, there's a continuum in terms of the anti-money laundering system and the evolution of sanctions. And so this, this stuff wasn't invented, uh, you know, on September 12, 2001, of course. 
but what you had in in the immediate aftermath, in particular to deal with terrorist financing, was uh, an amplification of the tools and ex- an expansion of the tools. And I'll and I'll get into that in just a second. But also a realization that that there were a set of um, relationships, uh, information, um, and what I call financial diplomacy that that actually could be brought to bear in a fairly significant way, in a way that we hadn't aggressively focused before, to get at some of these problems. And so when you think about this period, it's really a period of where some of the same tools that we've uh, used in the past, targeted sanctions, for example, were put on steroids. And as I said, Executive Order 13224 is the best example of that, where really there was a sense that we're going to now uh, fundamentally and aggressively use this tool to be able to freeze assets and to identify the, the rogue and pariah actors in the system because of their linkages to terrorist groups. And that's going to g- go to the heart of the financial system, if need be, uh, with banks or non-bank financial institutions that are a part of it. And so, uh, you know, those kinds of tools were, were aggressive tools. Title III of the Patriot Act, uh, where we, we expanded uh, the regulatory requirements, not just on banks, but on non-bank financial institutions that had um, either been in a gray zone in terms of regulatory reach or had just been uh, fallen outside of the Bank Secrecy Act and the anti-money laundering system before 9-11. Title III very much um, sort of expanded the notion of what it meant to engage in due diligence and what it meant actually to have institutions responsible for being guardians of the system itself, for for engaging in uh, know your customer and related due diligence, suspicious activity reporting, currency transaction reporting, all all the key elements of the system, but broadening and deepening that in a way that really amplified the system itself and the participants in it. You also had the the, the aggressive use of uh, again what I term financial diplomacy, which was let's use the the, the networks, relationships, and in particular groups like the FATF, uh, Financial Action Task Force, to uh, get at th- this new problem and to ensure that we have an international coalition that is committed to the enforcement of the rules and regulations that matter for for the purpose of terrorism. And so that's why you had the assembly of the of FATF and as well the Egmont Group, uh, the group of financial intelligence units, uh, at the end of October, beginning of November uh, 2001 in Washington. Uh, it established the special recommendations on terrorist financing, which, as you all know, has been incorporated into the broader standards. And it just started a, a, a much broader and aggressive effort there at the UN, Interpol, other places, to look at how we could undermine uh, the enemy by going after its financial resources, or at least to protect the financial system from those effects. Uh, um, Go ahead. I was going to ask you about the FATF component, but maybe I didn't want to cut you off mid-thought there. But, you know, it seems as though um, that the initiative that you took, that um, Treasury had a great, uh, you know, deal of success in getting Russia to join FATF, in getting China to join FATF, and, you know, um, So I guess in in talking about FATF and and getting people to agree that there's this kind of international definition of counter uh, finance of terrorism, countering the finance of terrorism. Um, And, you know, so I want to put that out there. Maybe you have something to say about that. And maybe you could also talk about the limits of that. Uh, In your book, you say, for instance, you know, to this day, um, you know, Russia signed on. Uh, Sometimes we can't tell whether their enforcement actions are being used. Uh, to take down political opponents or whether they're being used to take down terrorists, that kind of thing. So maybe there's a there's a huge success there, but some some questions that remain about that success. Yeah, I, I think I think still some major major questions, and and I think that the interesting thing and important element of the FATF, in part um, because it's a community, it's a it's a um, it's a stratified uh, community of interest focused on uh, the anti-money laundering world and uh, financial integrity, uh, one that sort of had been obviously well-established before 9-11, but really was amplified. The, the, the interesting thing, the way we thought of it, was that this is really uh, not only a driver of standards and, and recommendations, but also the ability to hold uh, countries and participants to account. And it's really the only 
the only vehicle that you have internationally, or at least one one of the key vehicles internationally, to set those standards and then to to help uh, judge along with the help of the IMF and World Bank now the, against those standards. And I think a key component of this is setting out the framework for what is legitimate financial activity and what what is required of those banking centers and countries and jurisdictions that want to consider themselves a part of the legitimate financial world. Um, and so part of our strategy was to broaden the sense of participation in the FATF and also to keep on side the key actors like the Russians and the Chinese and as well later the Indians to say, look, you have to be a part of this solution. You obviously want your banks and financial sectors to be a part of it, but that means there has to be um, acceptance of the financial integrity and, and standards of this community. And so we, we were very concerted in our attempts, and, and those of you who know Ted Greenberg uh, know that Ted was a major force behind uh, working with the Russians in part to get them off the, the original blacklist, the NCCT list, uh, and then uh, to, to help them reform and to get them in, into the FATF itself. The Chinese, uh, folks like Paul de Garabedian at Treasury, were key to uh, helping, along with others in the FATF, usher in the Chinese, all with a the theory that it is much better to have those banking centers in those countries on side and part of making the rules and part of feeling ownership of those rules as opposed to having them feel like they're outsiders and either have to create alternative ways of dealing with the world or uh, simply rejecting the standards. Um, that is not perfect by any means, and it's not just the Russians and the Chinese. We've seen this, and you've seen the uh, notices that have come out of the FATF plenaries, especially this summer, where countries, including member states, uh, member jurisdictions like Turkey and Austria, uh, have not been um, co as cooperative as they need to be or certainly have deficiencies in their system. We've seen that in the context of Argentina as well, where you have longstanding members that have just not um, been uh, upholding the standards. And so I think part of the part of the challenge for the international community is holding um, countries and jurisdictions to account. And I think it's that's driven uh, the FATF's um, recent assessment methodologies where, where they've moved from a box-checking uh, exercise in terms of uh, compliance with, this, with the recommendations to a question of effectiveness. Uh, how this will play out, I think, you know, is still up in the air. But the question we have to have for the international community and the community of interest on this is, are we being effective in stopping the flows of illicit capital, whether it's terrorist financing, proliferation financing, organized crime proceeds? Are we being effective in stopping those flows, preventing them from getting in the system to begin with, or finding ways of, of stopping them or attaching them or enforcing against them? And so I think that's that's the essence of the FATF and, and the role it plays, and I think that was part of our thinking uh, in the initial stages right after 9-11, and I think that, that has uh, held up. Juan, Juan one, uh, another point kind of before you do the choke points of stopping the flows is what you, I think a theme of your book was also reputation, reputational risk. And I, some of us that have been involved in this for a great many years know that there was some reputational hit in the 90s if your bank was accused of having compliance deficiencies for drug trafficking. But certainly after 9-11, that dynamic changed considerably. Now, you talk a lot, and I'm sure Karen will have some questions about SWIFT, but you also mention working closely, you your, and, and others at the Treasury and others in the government, sitting down with bankers, and before you even get to information sharing, talking to them about improving their processes and procedures. You know, at the end of the day, it's all about, um, again, choking off the dollars. But the reputational hit that institutions get, which is even true today, because we've certainly seen some dramatic penalties in the past two years, that uh, does impact the market to some degree. Talk about the reputational aspect of the private sector that I think you folks – wasn't your total focus, but I think you raised to a level that we hadn't really seen before. John, thanks for the question because I think it's essential um, to recognize uh, that the, in some ways after 9-11 with the intensity of focus that we talked about and the sensitivities about flows of illicit capital, that in some ways the color of money changed, right, whereas – 
You may have had a Bank of New York problem in the past with uh, Russian organized crime. Certainly, you've had a BCCI, lots of scandal and problems there. Um, but I think in the post-9-11 period, there was really a sense that uh, in some ways banks were in the crosshairs of potential enforcement actions, uh, but also linchpins uh, and guardians at the gate of the financial system and real partners potentially. Uh, and a driver for that was reputational risk. You know, reputational risk, as your, as your participants uh, on this uh, webinar know, um, it is, a, is a real tangible commodity for uh, institutions, whether it's because of brand name or because of uh, market access or because of what it does to customer base. Reputational risk actually matters um, uh, fundamentally to the bottom line of organizations. And that was heightened, acutely so, in the post-9-11 period, where not only did institutions not want to be banking for al-Qaeda, but institutions did not want to find themselves on the front pages of the Wall Street Journal or Financial Times for having violated uh, actions. Now, it's clear, you know, the banking community is not perfect, and we've, we've seen that over and over again with the cease and desist orders and the, the DPAs and and the other enforcement measures taken for uh, failings in terms of anti-money laundering systems and, and uh, sanctions uh, uh, enforcement and compliance problems. But that said, it, 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 these enforcement actions in some ways have reinforced the sensitivity to reputation. And I think you know, the best example of this to me is the Riggs Bank example, because I often hear, well, you know what, these banks really don't get hit that hard, um, you know, uh, you know, Tens of millions of, of dollars in terms of a fine, or even a you know one point some billion dollar fine for a bank, really isn't all that much. It, you know, in a, in some ways it looks like it's a cost of doing business, and they you know they get away pretty much scot free. Well, the reality is that the reputational taint and effect is actually uh, the gravest part of the enforcement action. It's not necessarily the number of uh, zeros behind the dollar sign or the pound sign. It's important, but but it's more so the sense of the integrity of the institution itself and the, the downstream downstream impact of that. The best example is Riggs Bank. Remember, Riggs Bank was hit with uh, a number of anti-money laundering violations, systemic and some specific, some related to the, to the Pinochet accounts, etc. Um, but the, the amounts of the fines were not Significant. I mean, if you look back, uh, you know, it, it, you know, we're talking, we're talking, uh, relatively speaking, not much at all. But Riggs Bank is no more. It no longer sits across the Treasury Department. It's no longer um, the most important bank in the most important capital of the world, as it used to call itself. It's no longer there because of the reputational impact uh, that that action or set of anti-money laundering and enforcement actions had on the bank. And and yeah, I think quick. that's rep. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. I'm sorry. Just a, just a quick follow-up, and then I want to hand it back to Karen. But on that on that point, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think we all use Riggs Bank as, uh, lack of a better term, the poster child of reputational risk. One one fallout from that, which uh, some of us worked on with you, when that was one of the key um, risk issues was the fact that Riggs did virtually all the embassy banking in the United States. So right. once they went away, there was a concern at the State Department because institutions rightly said, we're not getting in this business going forward. And I know there was a lot of back and forth between you folks and state about how do you get the, the financial sector uh, to raise their hand and say, well, well, we'll take it, even though they know that there's the potential that that risk, while I certainly believe it can be mitigated, the fear is that potentially it couldn't. So talk a little bit about that, because that's a byproduct, it seems to me, of the work that the financial sector does in anti-money laundering. So they make decisions on what they are going to accept and not going to accept, and it can affect the market. It certainly can affect legitimate business. I'm sure you'll talk later about Hawala's, and, and, and I think that's related to this. And then later on, hopefully, we'll get you to opine on virtual currency. But there's a lot of things out there that it's just not black or white. You have to make tough decisions. And as you know, when you're in the private sector, it's not that simple. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And the, the embassy banking issue, you know, raises all sorts of uh, very uh, important and fundamental policy questions. There's some uh, some interesting regulatory issues as well, as, as you know, John. But uh, yeah, I think I think what happened with rigs in the embassy banking uh, 
reflects, uh, you know, two or three key things. One, um, it demonstrates sort of the the inability of government at times to provide uh, the private sector or actors in the in the private markets with the kind of surety and clarity that's necessary uh, to be able to make the kinds of uh, cost-benefit analysis based on risk uh, that's necessary in the banking world. And uh, as you said, John, I was at the Treasury at the, at the height of that problem where we were trying to figure out, you know, how do we, how do we ensure that, you know, the, the embassies have access to banking facilities without providing a blank check uh, to the private sector to uh, ignore what are potential risks, for example, the corruption risks that were attendant to uh, accounts held by Equatorial Guinea, for example, which was always a, a problem, or, or concerns about Saudi accounts uh, in light of a lot of the attention that the Saudis were getting post 9-11. So uh, it, it, that period reflected um, an inability of the government to provide clarity to the private sector, which is often replicated in other contexts as well, where the government may have information, may not, uh, but certainly is not in a position to be able to provide uh, greater clarity to the private sector. And in that case, as you know, and this still happens today, in some ways the uh, cajoling of, of banks to take on some riskier accounts is left to the diplomats because the Treasury, of course, as a regulator uh, in the space, can't uh, necessarily be uh, jawboning uh, banks uh, and asking them to take on certain accounts, and then uh, suddenly come back a year later with uh, with uh, regula- regulators uh, to enforce, and so that creates complications with how the government interacts with the private sector. The 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 more interesting, and I think broader point here is, uh, you know that that set of actions uh, is reflective of an environment where legitimate financial institutions. Uh, for reputational reasons and for the cost-benefit analysis, are just not willing to take on certain lines of business or activities that will put them in regulatory jeopardy. Um, and I think that's a, a key question that persists um, for banks around the world, uh, whether it's embassy banking or money service businesses or dealing with uh, you know, at-risk jurisdictions or communities that, that appear to be uh, targeted by law enforcement. There's a whole range of, of arenas where, uh, in theory, you want the banking community to be involved. And in, in part, you, you have governments pushing the banks to uh, expose themselves more. But the reality being that the enforcement environment is such that it, there's a risk aversion uh, that's heightened uh, by the banks, meaning that they're not going to take the business. And the final well, point I would make, just a quick final point, fundamentally, uh, and this is, a, I think, important for the listeners. I think we're in a tough period for uh, the anti-money laundering system because we talk about a fundamental paradigm of a, of a risk-based uh, system, paradigm. Uh, but that abuts against a zero-tolerance enforcement environment at times, or at least the perception of that. And that is where you create this heightened degree of sensitivity and risk aversion. You know, um, too, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, post-9-11 and in terms of keeping banks uh, and other financial institutions honest, but I guess in this case we're talking primarily about banks, one of the things that I found was interesting in the book was um, the getting of SWIFT information and the kind of agreements and the diplomacy and perhaps even a little bit of arm twisting that went into the uh, getting access to SWIFT information. And I wondered if you could talk about, particularly since this is an ongoing debate uh, and uh, with the EU right now uh, debating how they're going to, whether they're going to continue to cooperate and how much SWIFT information they're going to be giving us, uh, giving the U.S. government, um, Talk about the maybe maybe a little bit that history of when you kind of realized how important that information was, how you went about getting access to it, and what's at stake, what it meant, what it uncovered, and, and then maybe an observation about um, where it stands. Sure, it's a great question, and and one of the interesting things that I found as I was researching for the for the book is, you know, SWIFT had been approached uh, a couple of times before in its history, several times by. Uh, law firms and others and, and some regulators trying to get access to specific 
uh, stashes of data uh, relevant to cases and such. And SWIFT had done a very good job of sort of beating them back, uh, making the argument that they're, they're in essence a messaging service. They're not a financial institution. And so in many ways, the regulations that apply to financial institutions are just not apt for a mes messaging service. And that, that had been a fundamental tenet of, of SWIFT, uh, which is, as your listeners know, the, the bank messaging system based in Brussels, used by most of the most of the banking world. Um, so one one of the one of the interesting uh, sort of anecdotes, uh, and uh, and it's in the book, is that you know Bob Mueller, when he was uh, at the Department of Justice in a, in a former life uh, in government, um, went along with the FinCEN director at the time, uh, as well as Ted Greenberg. Uh, to approach SWIFT uh, to see if uh, there could be not only a, a broadening of some of the data fields and, and inclusion of more data, but also some sort of sharing arrangement. And um, he was kindly received, but you know didn't walk away with any deliverables. Uh, in the mid-90s, SWIFT was approached by uh, FATF representatives to talk about um, you know, wire standards, data uh, in 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 wires, originator, uh, beneficiary information, how that how that gets captured, um, and talking about sort of cooperative efforts. Uh, and in many ways, SWIFT still kept itself apart from a lot of the sort of anti-money laundering or sanctions work. Uh, and so, what happened post 9/11 is that. Um, people at the Treasury, uh, people smarter than I, um, thought about um, the kinds of financial information we needed to follow the money. Um, and if we were being asked by the president and certainly as part of a, a new paradigm of going after terrorist financing with financial tools, we had to think aggressively about how we use financial intelligence. And it wasn't just, you know, how do we use SARS more more smartly? It was uh, how do we find new sources of information? How do we use them creatively? How do we analyze it properly? And then how do we uh, action it uh, for either enforcement actions or, or otherwise? And, um, you know, folks at the Treasury um, thought about SWIFT, uh, understand, uh, understood it, uh, and made an approach to, uh, you know, SWIFT leadership. At the time, an American CEO by the name of Lenny Schrank, uh, a New Yorker, uh, deeply patriotic, but also fiercely defensive uh, of SWIFT's interests. And what emerged was um, uh, a process by which the Treasury issued OFAC subpoenas tied to uh, the International Economic Emergency Powers Act um, to access SWIFT data and the creation of a process by which SWIFT data would be transferred to the Treasury uh, for purposes of analysis uh, but in a fairly unique way, in that uh, the, the SWIFT was very careful about the the, the loss of control of the, its data, and so uh, determined that it not only wanted to make sure that it was able to audit what was done with the data, that it was secured properly, and that it was being used uh, in a constricted way uh, based on the privacy and civil liberties that were embedded in it, but they actually also, for the first time that I'm aware of, uh, negotiated for uh, their own representatives to to be able to sit side by side with the very analysts who were doing this work to be able to stop the use of the data if there was a perceived uh, problem or, or malfeasance in, in the use of, of the data. And so what you saw emerge was, uh, for, for purposes of Treasury, uh, um, a very important uh, sort of data set, over time constricted, frankly, uh, to look at suspect terrorist financial connections to serve as another piece in the puzzle of a, sort of the intelligence mosaic about what we knew about al-Qaeda or support networks, revealing things like um, helping to find Hambali's location, the, the terrorist in Southeast Asia, revealing the, the Paracha network in New York and Pakistan that was providing support to al-Qaeda. So very, very important links and, and others that the Treasury Department has, has now made public uh, but importantly, I think a very good example of how you think about access to uh, mass amounts of data, but also constrain it and demonstrate that you can actually abide by constraints on its use. Um, that, of course, um, after the 2006 revelation by the New York Times, that has created controversy. Uh, 
and remains a source of controversy, especially now in the wake of Edward Snowden and leaks about what the U.S. is doing um, in terms of surveillance. Lots of controversy in Europe about whether or not this program uh, should persist and whether or not the Europeans will even allow it. Right. And do you have any, you know, crystal ball on that one as to how that's going to get re resolved or what, you know, I guess you, you're making a case right here that the information is pretty important to us. It is. I, you know, the, the more that it's talked about, though, and the more that people understand how uh, SWIFT works, uh, and of course SWIFT has gotten pulled into the Iran debate as well, which we can talk about if folks are interested, but the, the more people understand, I think the less valuable it becomes. But I, feel, I still think it's an important part of the broader mosaic. And, you know, I, I think there has been broad opposition, especially from the EU parliamentarians who focus on the privacy and civil liberties issues and data privacy issues, broad opposition to its continuation or at least its aggressive use. And I think there's some wind in their sails given all the, the, that's come out in the Snowden debates. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, given that the U.S. in some ways has been the all-service provider for, uh, in particular, Western governments, but others as well, in terms of what this information reveals, uh, and again, the Treasury has talked about the, the types of plots and information that this financial information has been helpful for, a lot of that's been helpful for our allies abroad. And I, I lay out a story in the, in the book where, after the 2006 uh, revelation, Stuart Levy uh, went abroad uh, and basically put on the table the stack of reports that had gone to a foreign counterpart related to leads coming out of the terrorist financing tracking program. And the question he had for his counterpart across the table is, do you want us to stop sending you these? And of course the answer is no, we want it. Um, and I think at the end of the day, um, the, the realities of, of the, the threats that we face and the, the fact that we if we can demonstrate that we can constrain the use of the information, we can protect it, and that civil liberties really aren't fundamentally at risk, I think there's value to the program, and I think it persists. But that takes a lot of uh, financial diplomacy. It takes a lot of uh, raw diplomacy, uh, and it takes perhaps some other value examples to expl explain to people why it's still relevant in 2013 as opposed to when this was created in 2001. Well, it seems like one of the things that you're suggesting is that we shouldn't talk about this anymore. So let me. <laughs> well, maybe maybe I shouldn't have written the book then. <laughs> maybe, so let me let me go on to uh, another question um, and, and talk. You, you've touched on Iran and the sanctions regime being used against Iran, and I, I think I want to ask a, a broad question. You know, your, your book again. One of the reasons I'd recommend this to people who are who are living in this world and this have to deal with this topic from uh, from the point of view of financial institutions is that you kind of talk a little bit about the history of sanctions. And I have a vivid memory of sneaking into a foreign service class at Georgetown many years ago and hearing a lecture about how economic sanctions never work. Um, and I think that you talk about throughout the book where they worked and where they didn't work. So maybe we could talk, you, you, could, you could sort of lay out the case for sanctions and how you think they've been crafted so that they work, and maybe we can return to then some of the current sanction regimes that are in place. Absolutely. Um, I think one thing to keep in mind when I talk about the use of financial power post 9-11, uh, sanctions certainly are a cornerstone of, of those kinds of powers, but it's not the only kind of power. And I think sometimes... Um, both the lexicon and, and the tradition in this field tends to constrict how we talk about and think about the use of these powers. And so when I talk about, both in the book and lecturing on this, talk about the financial pressure uh, and campaigns against countries like Iran, uh, I, I point out that it's more than just sanctions, uh, because the, the traditional sanctions that we often talk about, and in particular the diplomatic community thinks about, really are... Um, uh, trade-based um, uh, embargo-like uh, sanctions that were born out of the desire to change the behavior of nation states and to uh, fence ring their economies writ large. And um, the ability to do that uh, in concert with diplomatic moves and so often reliant on what happens at the UN or in terms of bilateral talks. But at the end of the day, uh, largely uh, trade-based 
uh, in, a, in an attempt to um, to undermine the, the the economy of the broad broadly the economy of a country. Again, in the 90s, we had evolution of targeted sanctions, of course, and in the Balkans, uh, that was used to some some effect, I think, and and used well. And of course, we've seen. Uh, sanctions that have worked, I think, pressured in the case of, uh, of South Africa. In other cases, um, uh, arbitraged and, and misused, as the case of Saddam Hussein and the leveraging of the oil for food program and, and, the, and the abuse of that. And so there, there's all sorts of kind of history to sanctions. But I think, importantly, in this post-9-11 period, we viewed sanctions as uh, not just uh, you know the the principal tool, but one tool of many to try to isolate uh, rogue financial actors from the system, and focusing very much on illicit conduct. You know, the the it's the illicit conduct that drives it versus a diplomatic maneuver or or uh, or a set of set of uh, initiatives. It was really the fundamental risk to the to the financial system that was at the core of thinking about this. The other part that's important to realize in the evolution is you had um, a recognition that it was, you know, banks unto themselves with the reputational risk we've talked about that would drive business decisions and the exiting of clients or the decision not to do business at all. And that often didn't have anything to do with a formal sanction. That had to do with the risk calculus in the boardroom or in the compliance office of a, of a particular bank. And that that was just as powerful, if not more so, uh, than a particular designation by OFAC or a, a listing at the UN. Although those are powerful. Um, so, and so, you, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to ask you to speak a little bit specifically about what's working or not working. You know, what what the outcome is with regard to Iran, and then maybe you want to say something about Syria. Right. I I, I think I think the reason. And, and this goes then to the sort of the, the fundamental debate in the U.S. government, and even in popular culture, where we, we've had a, a sense of the orthodoxy of, okay, we've got, we've got sanctions, okay, we understand that, uh, but they're either unilateral or multilateral, and they're kind of like on-off switches. Well, the reality in this post-9-11 period is that the financial pressure that we've talked about that isolates illicit conduct and illicit actors is really multilateral by design and by nature, given the globalized financial system and, frankly, given the power of the dollar. Uh, and so that the, this old orthodoxy of unilateral, multilateral really doesn't apply anymore. Everything is multilateral in a sense if you're talking about the financial community. And so w what, what we had to sort of break down was this notion that you really couldn't do anything else to the North Koreans or the Iranians. You don't do business with them. We don't trade with them. They don't have uh, lots of uh, assets in New York, although – the Iranians obviously had a building that we just seized the other day. But, you know, there's not much you can do to them. We've had these sanctions for decades. It really hasn't affected much. But the reality is their chief organs that rely on uh, the raising of funds for purposes uh, of the regime, for illicit purposes, they rely on the banking system. They rely on relationships with the legitimate financial and commercial world to do business, whether it's Office 39 for North Korea, which – does a lot of their illicit activity uh, to include the drug smuggling, counterfeiting, $100 bills, and the rest, or the Revolutionary Guard in Iran, which runs a huge chunk of the economy, the telecoms industry, the oil sector, the South Pars Field Project, uh, a lot of the port infrastructure. All oh, that's the Revolutionary Guard. Um, and so what has worked has been the ability to tag – uh, that illicit conduct, that, that dangerous, suspicious conduct of these elements of the state that are also engaged in things like nuclear proliferation to the financial system to say, look, you, you need to know who your customer is. And the reality is you don't know who your customer is in dealing with uh, these organizations or these uh, companies representing this country. And ergo, it's dangerous and risky to do business. Now, the the challenge with that is – in maximalist form, you start to look like uh, it looks like a classic embargo. Um, you also then, you know, you create incentives for workarounds, and I think that's one of the key challenges here. Where you have rogue actors trying to help each other work around the financial sanctions, and, and it takes the simplest form of stripping, 
on wire transfers, which you all know well, to uh, bartering arrangements in the case of Iran, to uh, the high-end sort of development of alternatives to the dollar in terms of, of trade and, and finance, uh, the bartering relationships for the renminbi, uh, for example. So I, I think there are uh, major challenges to the system, but I think what has worked fundamentally is to isolate those actors um, in the international system that are trying to access the banking system for illicit purposes and raising the level of suspicion, the level of risk um, aversion uh, for the financial community is at the heart of that. And frankly, that's why the Iranians have called this the hidden war. It's exactly why President Rouhani has made uh, the lifting of financial pressure uh, the singular goal of the, of the nuclear talks. And by the way, it's why their first order of request is not the lifting of the oil embargo, a classic trade sanction, but a reinjection into the SWIFT system as, uh, uh, as they were cut off by EU mandate. And so I think that's representative of the fact that it's the banking isolation that at its heart has been the most effective in isolating these, these regimes. Hey, Juan, just I, a couple things. I want to go back a little bit, but we've gotten a few questions because we've talked a lot about SWIFT. Um, just some basic questions. Who actually runs SWIFT? And you mentioned uh, the, the CEO or the, the rep that was in the States. But give folks a little perspective. It is interesting. I mean, obviously our audience are folks in the banking sector to some degree, uh, and this issue has been around for quite a while, but there's still some, some basic questions regarding a actually – how SWIFT as a messaging system works. You want to talk a little bit about that, and then I want to go back, if I could, to the, <coughs> the change in Homeland Security and how it impacted Treasury, because we've got a few questions there as well. Perfect. Um, uh, SWIFT um, it was established in Brussels in the mid-'70s um, as a way of allowing banks to securely uh, pass messages uh, for purposes of payment, uh, and uh, transfers of of, um, of capital and for uh, general banking transactions. It happens in individual tranches. It happens in batches. Uh, but SWIFT has really uh, set itself as the uh, principal banking switchboard, if you will, uh, for bank messages. And it has done that in a way um, – where it has uh, sold itself uh, and, and marketed itself, frankly, as uh, a safe, secure, efficient way of plugging into the global financial system. Uh, and if you're a major bank, um, you in many ways need and want uh, to leverage that system to be able to communicate with other banks around the world, whether it's a correspondent bank or otherwise. And so SWIFT has established itself as that sort of central switchboard it's run by a board, uh, representatives of, of major banks usually sit on the board. There's a CEO. Um, the oversight of it actually comes from the G10 bank, central banks. Um, so the Federal Reserve helps to oversee SWIFT. Um, and, it, you know, in the post-9-11 period, what you, what you saw was, I think, an acceleration of what had been um, sort of uh, – it's, it's sort of been uh, – uh, experimented with before, and I mentioned those examples where the question was whether or not SWIFT was going to provide more of its information to law enforcement or to um, government authorities to allow them to get at illicit financial activity. Uh, and in many ways, SWIFT has tried to remain not only apart from uh, some of the regulatory uh, requirements of bank institution, uh, banking institutions, but also They've tried to remain apolitical, to be able to say to the Irans of the world, the Pakistans, the, the Chinas, the Saudis, you know, we are an apolitical body. We are a switchboard. We are a safe, secure mechanism. Uh, we do not want to get into the middle of uh, sanctions debates or uh, we don't want to be used as a tool. And I think one of the challenges for SWIFT is it has been now sort of revealed in a sense to more um, conventional uh, folks uh, who aren't sort of banking experts, uh, they understand now that SWIFT is essential uh, to banking connectivity. It's not the only way, but it is a, the principal way for banks to connect. And that's why the European Union, not the U.S., by the way, European Union um, uh, mandated that the designated Iranian banks 
be unplugged from the SWIFT system, which was really the first time SWIFT got pulled into a country program or into a political dispute of that sort, um, which is very uncomfortable for them. And uh, they don't like it. Uh, and I think it, in some ways it raised um, questions as to whether or not uh, SWIFT would be able to remain apolitical moving forward or whether or not they would get pulled into every major international um, crisis, in part because the financial matters now are so central to national security that people either on the Hill or in Brussels or Stuttgart, <coughs> Stuttgart excuse me, are thinking about SWIFT uh, the moment they think about a hard problem. And I think that's um, it's an interesting thing to watch, in part because uh, SWIFT is going to get pulled right into the debate on uh, the Iran nuclear issue because the Iranians are raising it. Juan, I got a question from... Um uh, someone who describes himself as a longtime IRS agent, um, and he uh, has seen, uh, he or she has seen, an increase in obviously the responsibilities of IRS criminal beyond uh, tax issues. And he, he specifically mentions, you know, what should our role be besides being involved in the Joint Terrorism Task Force regarding terrorist financing? What I thought from that question, what it led me to was going back in the book to the the sections on bad banks and the section you call blowfish. One of the things that I think are important for AML professionals to understand is who's, who does what. And when you came into office, as it were, what you did then versus what you had to, to do afterwards to get to stay relevant or different. So one of the things, you know, we certainly are aware that the IRS criminal division does a lot of work in the anti-money laundering space. So does Homeland Security, the FBI, there's a whole series of agencies, and you hope they're all working together, right? And we know sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. But sometimes you know, they fight. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I was just adding uh, humorously, sometimes they fight. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they fight. But give us a sense, uh, as you were trying to uh, make a fairly quick decision once Homeland Security was created, uh, and what Treasury, for lack of a better term, still owns, in this space, in, in the anti-money laundering, counterterrorism financing space, and maybe if you'd like, obviously, a little bit about uh, the debate that went on at that point, because you do talk about your view, and I think I and I and I know I agree with you. The Treasury was not considered to be on par with the Justice Department, and the FBI in those days. You were, you know, you, while you did have clear roles there, you were more seen as the group that printed money, did fiscal policy, all those sorts of things. But certainly, you had the Secret Service, you had customs, and that was kind of stripped out and taken from the Treasury office. Give us a sense of that, because I think it's not just historical from from my view. It's where we are today so that practitioners know who's responsible for what. I think that becomes pretty important. It's a great set of questions, John, and um, I want to thank the IRS um, uh, agent for for listening and for his service. yeah, the the 2002-2003 the period was seminal in terms of uh, sort of redefining what Treasury did. Um, and as you said, the stripping of the guns and badges, uh, the principal ones that were known, Secret Service, ATF, Customs, in, even the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, which Treasury ran. And at the time, we had about 40% of federal law enforcement. And to the extent we had a seat at the table, the enforcement table, it was because we had bodies and we had huge responsibilities like those of Customs and Secret Service. And so um, with that stripped away, um, it created a number of questions. The most fundamental for me at the time, uh, I was left behind some ways to uh, pick up the pieces, was the fact that uh, the only guns and badges we had left were IRS CID uh, agents. Um, and that principally what we were left with was our policy role uh, at the main treasury and our financial diplomatic role with the FATF and otherwise. We had OFAC, of course, uh, with its sanctions uh, administration enforcement. We had FinCEN uh, administering the Bank Secrecy Act. Uh, and we had TOF, the Treasury Executive Office for Asset Forfeiture. Um, and that was it. And the fundamental question is, okay, what are we then in the national security complex, if we are no longer really uh, part of the guns and badges community, despite uh, the IRS being part of it. And that was a fundamental moment. And and we made the decision uh, and and said quite explicitly to each other, a small group left behind, folks like Danny Glazer and Chip Ponce and uh, 
uh, and, and key minds like like those that look, you know, Treasury is unique. Uh, the guns and badges didn't make us unique. The guns and badges, in some ways, were viewed by DOJ and others as redundant or as competitive. Uh, but what Treasury is at its core, aside from being about money, um, as, as Sam Bodman would say, you know, there's one thing consistent about Treasury, it's about money. Um, but it, it was that we had unique information, unique relationships, unique tools and authorities that nobody else had and that allowed us to reach globally in terms of the financial system. And so we were going to devise strategies that actually leverage that fundamentally and use tools like Section 311 of the Patriot Act to demonstrate where we could bring huge value, not just to law enforcement, but to the national security complex. And that led to the Bad Bank Initiative, where we targeted key banks around the world that were, in essence, bad actors in the system and facilitating everything from organized crime and sanctions evasion to terrorist financing and, um, and, uh, and counterfeiting. Uh, and we did that. And that, that's what led to the identification of Banco Delta Asia uh, in 2003. And so, uh, and ultimately uh, 311 in, in 2005. But, um, you know, what we were left with was a fundamental question about not only what, what is Treasury, but what's the rest of, of government going to look like? And interestingly, John, we were, um, you know, tasked to do a lot of very complicated things and didn't have a lot of resources uh, that we controlled. Uh, one of the interesting things we were asked to do was hunt Saddam Hussein's assets. And I, I mentioned that in the chapter called, uh, and tell the story in the chapter called The Mother of All Financial Investigations, where we in essence relied uh, principally on IRS uh, CID agents to go abroad um, and to, to not only go in country in Iraq, but to go to places like Syria and Jordan and Lebanon and elsewhere to find uh, Iraq's bank accounts, Saddam Hussein's bank accounts, uh, where they had assets, and then to help us formulate strategies to get at them. Um, folks like Larry Kaiser and Alan Schick and uh, Scott Schneider were all a part of that. And so, um, interestingly, we leveraged what we could uh, to execute the sort of broader missions that we had. Uh, but importantly, too, in this period, I don't think there was a, a rationalization, and this is, I think, one of the deficits of this period, it was not a rationalization of the law enforcement responsibilities. And so a lot of the tension and fractures that we had before 9-11 um, in some ways were just replicated uh, in a new department, actually a bigger department uh, called Homeland Security. And so a lot of the tension between customs and FBI uh, in some ways persisted. A lot of the questions between ATF and the FBI, despite the fact that ATF was pulled into DOJ, persisted, the role of DEA in money laundering uh, versus uh, the role of the IRS or the FBI, not wholly clear. And so I think we are, we are still suffering from, from a bit of jurisdictional overlap, much of which is done in good faith, but which creates, um, creates uh, all sorts of questions uh, within the government as well as with, within the communities that are affected by the enforcement actions as to who, do, who does what. The same goes on the regulatory side, as folks know, who, who deal with the banking regulators, um, who aren't necessarily uh, coordinated uh, and who certainly have different views as to how to perceive uh, questions of safety and soundness in the, in the money laundering context. And so I think well, we, we we haven't good. solved we haven't solved uh, sort of the Byzantine regulatory structure, and as the the questioner raised, in some ways we've added layers to it because of what we've asked the IRS in particular to do in terms of regulation of things like the money service business sector. Well, and that's interesting. I was going to I had sort of a mini follow up to John's question, uh, and that was you know could we be at all assured um, that information sharing is happening, you know, to a greater degree than it was pre-9-11, and it sounds like you're kind of giving a mixed report, so maybe you might want to say something about how that could be better. Uh, and then after that, I want, to, I want to ask you some things. We have a number of questions about charities and monitoring for charities, but maybe... Yeah, no, I, I, in, term, in terms of information sharing, I think there, there are different... Uh, layers to this, because I think there's no question that in the post-9-11 environment, 
uh, the sharing between law enforcement and intelligence, uh, sharing between regulators and, and others, has tended to be much better. I, mean, I think that's sort of the bottom line. It's not perfect, and there's all sorts of gaps that we still see, and, and, and those are sometimes problematic. But I think in general, things are better. I think the challenge comes in the public-private information exchange. And I know from my experience and certainly now being on the outside looking in, the, the deep frustration in the private sector about the lack of more specific information about threats and risk, the kind, the kind of information that not only allows, for example, banks or money service businesses to identify bad actors, but frankly to understand better the contours of risk. You know, sometimes that's just not available from the government. Government may not have it, or we just might, might not have the right mechanisms to actually share that information despite the fact that we have BSAG out there, despite the fact that ACAMS provides a great forum for these kinds of things. Even with all that, there, there is perhaps a dearth of, of that kind of information sharing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm happy to, to address the, the challenge of charities if you want, Karen. I, mean, um, yeah, I think that'd be great. Uh, just to, to kind of fill that question in a little bit, we have a question about KYC requirements for monitoring charities, and someone brings up you know, Syria humanitarian relief, um, there's some questions about Al Shabaab. Um, clearly, obviously, you know, pretty much a big burning concern for people, uh, and monitoring NGOs and concerns about NGOs. So that's th th this is very much in the mind of the audience as questions come in. And go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a great set of questions, and it harkens a little bit back to our discussion about embassy banking and. Um, you know, the reality is that um, certain vehicles have been used in the past by terrorist groups and organized crime organizations to raise or move money. Um, charities are not immune from that. And in fact, some groups like Hamas and Hezbollah, which are designated terrorist groups by the U.S. government, including Al Qaeda, uh, you know, ha the, those types of groups have used charities, either embedded themselves or leveraged the reach of these charities. Um, for their own uh, financial and, and recruiting benefit. And so there's, there's no question that that's an issue. But I think what your questioners are asking is a, is a really important and fundamental one, which is um, do the KYC and due diligence requirements of these kinds of sectors, or at least the, the banking community uh, that has to deal with these sectors, does it create too much of an onus, so much so that we're chilling charitable giving, uh, we're forcing people out of particular sectors, or in the case of, for example, the money service business uh, remittance operations for diaspora communities, are we, as we're seeing in the UK, uh, are, are we just seeing the pure exiting of a particular line of business in a particular jurisdiction like Somalia because the calculus is that it's just too risky, it's not worth it. And I think that's a major, that balance is a major challenge in this new era uh, because we have put the onus on financial institutions to make their own risk calculus. At the same time, we are asking and promoting with a lot of our policies the idea of financial inclusion. Um, and frankly, for some of these financial warfare techniques to work, there has to be a globalized financially inclusive system at play. Um, but the challenge is if we are creating a, a sense of not just regulatory risk, but uh, reputational risk that's attendant to doing business either with a charity that's trying to help refugees in Syria or in the Palestinian territories, or, or um, you know, uh, you know, a money remittance operation out of Minneapolis or out of London, flowing money into Mogadishu. If the bottom line is that we're just we're forcing the exclusion of some of the activity, <coughs> that may not be the right answer at the end of the day. And, and so, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is we, we have to think about, in some ways, remediating against those uh, negative externalities because we, we do need the, the banking system to work. We do need it to be inclusive. We certainly don't want illicit actors to be banking, uh, but we also don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that means there may need to be a, a more proactive effort by governments to figure out what, what safe giving channels look like. It may require charitable backfill in certain instances. Um, and so there, there are a series of things that could be thought about and done uh, 
that are often difficult for the government to do, but have to be done clearly in partnership with the financial industry and the affected sectors. And I know folks like Chip Ponce, and, you know, when I was at Treasury, I did a lot of the outreach to the NGO community. There's a lot of angst about uh, even the voluntary guidelines that were put out in terms of their, uh, their activities in crisis regions. And so I think this is just something we're going to have to work through as the system evolves. But we've got to be very careful we don't reach a tipping point where financial institutions make the uh, regulatory and risk call that it's just not worth it to do business in any of these jurisdictions or any of these business lines. And what we're left with is a vacuum filled by less uh, responsible actors. Well, you know, you uh, in the book you talk about post-9-11 um, – some of the negotiations that you entered into and some of the um, attempts at, uh, you know, persuasion uh, with the Saudis. Um, and clearly they responded on some of that uh, and not on, you know, and, and, and yet were reluctant to respond in, in other, uh, with regard to other charities that were connected to uh, the Saudi government or to the Saudi people. Um, I don't know, do you have any sense of, you know, uh, this clearly is an ongoing problem, I would gather, both in, in the Middle East uh, because of the vast variety of uh, actors involved and the injunction to participate in charities that's part of Islam, uh, stuff that is both used for good and, and not. Yeah. Maybe there's, I, I guess I'm getting at what's the political element and what your, you know, when you look, we've, we've, we've talked about the role of banks in policing this stuff. Also, what's the... Um, What's the diplomatic and uh, effort that's, that's involved, too? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and Chapter 3 of the book, for those who are interested, uh, gets into the, this question in depth. Um, and the Saudi issue was, was obviously a sensitive one, but an important one diplomatically. One thing I'll note um, just at the outset that's interesting, and I think important for uh, specialists in the field to understand is, in many ways, in this post-9-11 period, the focus on illicit finance or suspect financial activity, whether it's related to terrorism or otherwise, often emerge some very important strategic questions for uh, our diplomacy and our national security. And this is a good example of that, where we were looking at the financial conduits for al-Qaeda or al-Qaeda-associated groups, and the reality was that some of that was tied to um, uh, the charities in Saudi Arabia and in other parts of the Gulf and, and elsewhere uh, that either directly or indirectly supported the underlying ideology of al-Qaeda. And so one of the fundamental questions and issues with the Saudis was whether or not um, their program of proselytization of a particular brand of Islam, uh, a Wahhabi strand of, of Islam, whether or not some of those efforts were actually providing a platform and a basis for al-Qaeda to access not just locations around the world, but also funding. And so that, that was a fundamental question and still remains one uh, with, with the Saudis. Interestingly, though, in Saudi Arabia, they have especially given some of our financial diplomatic efforts uh, after 9-11 but also after al-Qaeda decided to attack inside the kingdom, uh, they have taken a very uh, aggressive and methodical uh, route to weeding out those that have supported al-Qaeda or related groups, uh, to include during the height of some of the foreign fighter problems in Iraq. And so Saudi Arabia has over time, um, especially in the context of al-Qaeda, uh, at the end of the day, proven pretty aggressive in terms of shutting down some of these conduits like al the, the their biggest charity, which they ultimately shut, shut down, um, and going after some of the donors by, uh, by arresting them, for example, and holding them to account. So some of this financial pressure has worked, but it has raised some of these fundamental questions. I would say, though, it's, and it's interesting, Karen, one of, the, one of the developments in the last year and a half, two years, is the fact that the Syrian conflict and the emergence of the Sunni Shia fighting, and certainly the, the rise of the rebellion there in Syria uh, that's tied to, in part tied to al-Qaeda, um, has resurrected some of these old networks that in many ways we had suppressed or deterred. And unfortunately, has started to look a little bit like the Soviet Mujahideen days when a lot of the financing of these uh, sort of more extremist militant groups 
was actually sanctioned by and supported by uh, some of our Gulf allies. And in the context of the Soviet Mujahideen, obviously it was intentional. It was part of the program uh, along with Pakistan uh, as supported by the U.S. But here you have countries like Qatar, Kuwait, um, and uh, I would say you know individuals, entities in Saudi Arabia that are finding it uh, beneficial and important to support uh, more extreme elements of, of the groups in Syria, which seems to be a legitimate cause, of course, if you're looking at the fall of Assad, but has real negative repercussions if you're talking about the resurrection of a Sunni violent extremist funding network that we had done a fairly good job of suppressing and dealing with, but that now may be uh, gathering some steam and support. And the Washington Post had a very good article the other day about the use of Twitter uh, by donors in the Gulf, in particular Kuwait, uh, to send money uh, into Syria via Turkey. And I think that's a, that's, a, that's a reflection of an adaptation of some of these old networks that are resurrecting themselves. Juan, um, you know, a lot of the questions that come in and a lot of questions we get at these conferences relate to what works, what doesn't work. Um, I thought that your chapter on uh, on the uh, on the situation using 311 with the bank in Macau, Banco De- Delta Asia, is, ex- is an extremely strong example of the part of the Patriot Act. I think 311 to me and 314, frankly, with his information sharing, although I – my humble opinion is 314 could have been more greatly expanded so that the, so that the sharing of information was actually two ways between the government and the private sector. But 311, the designations, we talked earlier about reputational risk. If you can, because we do want to leave time for you to tell us kind of where you see things going down the road, and a lot of questions have come in, what's, you know, what's working? There's some frustration from AML professionals. But I think here is a really solid example of how the Treasury Department – with working with the State Department, focused on uh, the 311 tool and really uh, had an a almost immediate impact on what was going on in Korea. Maybe you can walk us through that, uh, the thought process, but also more importantly the practical outcome of what happened when you used uh, the 311 designation back in, I think it was 2005. Right. No, Thank, thank you, John. I think that in some ways, the Banco Delta Asia 311 was the, the seminal example of the use of a uniquely treasury tool to impact in the national security uh, environment. And bear in mind, um, back in 2003, uh, we had launched this bad bank initiative, and we were looking around the world at, uh, at, at bad banks, uh, you know, in Latvia, Cyprus, um, you know, all over the world. Um, and what we came across in the context of North Korea was the fact that they had banking relationships that were, were allowing them to launder money, allowing them to place their super note, the counterfeit $100 bill, uh, allowing them to sort of move money tied to their proliferation programs, uh, uh, front companies run by Office 39, for example. And so interestingly, you know, North Korean state, known as the Soprano state, very much engaged in illicit financial activity uh, but also very much reliant on banks, uh, you know, outside of their borders, um, and in particular in places like Macau uh, and in Beijing. Uh, and keep in mind they had a bank uh, in Vienna called Golden Star Bank, which uh, in working with the U.S. government, the Austrians actually shut down prior to the Banco Delta Asia 311 action. But what we saw was that this bank, Banco Delta Asia, a small private bank run by Stanley Ho, the casino magnet, um, was a primary sort of uh, financial conduit for the regime and for a lot of the illicit activity. Um, and what we we set out to do was to isolate that bank, to do a couple of things. One, uh, to inoculate the system from that bank, because it was a bad bank, it was injecting a lot of uh, you know, sort of tainted capital into the system. Uh, and But two, more importantly, uh, to try to impact the... Uh, access to the financial system that the North Koreans had as a way of uh, not only, you know, stopping bad flows of funds into the system, but also as a, as a diplomatic lever to give te- teeth to the six-party talks and to, to what we were doing uh, on, on the diplomatic and nuclear front. So uh, what we did was we set out a 311 uh, uh, action, uh, which in essence, for those of you who've, who haven't read it, 
um, in essence, indicts the bank uh, with a, a, the list of grievances and, and delicts, but in so doing also uh, indicts the North Koreans for the range of illicit financial uh, activity. Bear in mind that we were cooperating at this by, by the time we hit 2004, we were cooperating closely with the State Department, which was also working with foreign counterparts on uh, and law enforcement to try to go after some of the illicit actors and cases. And so uh, working with the Australians in the seizure of the Pong Su, the, the drug-carrying um, uh, trawler off the co coast of Australia, uh, uh, the, uh, the Royal Charm smoking dragon cases run by the FBI and Secret Service on the east and west coasts of the U.S., um, and other types of, of law enforcement actions. And so this married with what we were trying to do to, to highlight and isolate North Korean illicit activity. And so what happened in September of 2005 was the publication of the proposed notice of rulemaking for uh, the 311 against Banco Delta Asia. Um, what that did was it unleashed what I call the financial furies uh, based on the reputational taint and risk tied to North Korean activity. And um, to just shorten the story in, in, in short order after the 311 was published, bear in mind a domestic regulatory rule, not even a final rule, a domestic regulatory rule, had no UN backing, had no multilateral um, sanction attached to it, no even bilateral uh, sort of set of uh, parameters. This was a U.S. regulatory rule. It shut down the bank. The Macanese authorities took it over. There was a run on the bank, a freezing of the North Korean accounts, the tune, the ones that were identified at least at the time, $25 million, not much, uh, but the, the accounts were frozen out. But more importantly, the ripple effect of other banks closing uh, accounts and activities that were tied to the North Koreans. And a lot of questions being asked of the North Koreans in terms of uh, KYC and due diligence as to what they were doing, how they were doing business. Um, then with the spade work of Treasury officials to follow the money and where the North Koreans were trying to do business in places like Mongolia and Vietnam to shut them out. And the reality was uh, that the North Koreans got frozen out of the banking system. And it wasn't about the $25 million, though, though the North Koreans would make the diplomacy around that. It was about their desire to plug back into the banking system and so three weeks after that action was taken, they called the White House and the State Department to say, we've got a problem, we've got to talk. And it was the first time in recent memory uh, for U.S. negotiators that the North Koreans had called us first for anything. And for about two years after that, they started and ended every negotiation with, uh, with the, the, the question, you know, when are we going to get our money back? Uh, which uh, you know, was not only a reflection of the power of these tools, but also um, uh, it gave our diplomacy some teeth. Now, I'm critical of how we unwound some of that pressure in the book. I, I laid out in the book, um, and it's important, I think, to learn some of those lessons because we may be in that position here shortly with Iran where there's a question as to how much of the financial pressure we give up uh, for the sake of a nuclear deal uh, and what is the right trade-off and right calculus. And so th that 311, John, to answer your question, was a great example of the use of uh, strategic uh, reputational risk as a commodity in the system, using a prompt, a tool the Treasury had to bring to bear, and to bring it to effect in a way that could impact our national security in a way that we thought was beneficial. Um, in some ways, it worked too well, and it outstripped our diplomacy, and that's where I think you saw a lot of the tension and confusion. And I lay that out. I think um, it, it's, a, it's a great part of the story. I lay it out in the book. Well, and just for our, um, for, for our listeners, uh, if you could, I, I think your point was, what, that we, uh, we gave up that financial leverage before we actually got delivery of what we wanted from the North Koreans. Could, could you be, just be specific about what you think went wrong there? Sure. I, I, think, uh, I think we cashed in too soon. I think we, we gave up the leverage too soon, um, and it wasn't in bad faith. I think the, the perception was, well, we, we finally have extreme leverage on the North Koreans. Let's use it. Let's use it. And the cost for reentry to the six-party talks for the North Koreans seemed relatively simple. It was the unfreezing of the $25 million in, in Banco Delta Asia. 
And so we went through uh, diplomatic gymnastics to get that money returned. But the problem is uh, threefold. One, again, we, I think we gave up the leverage too early uh, because it was really hurting the North Koreans. And they told the White House negotiator at the time uh, in, in private, you finally found a way to hurt us. And so they they were hurting. Another part of it was um, the Chinese themselves were forced – in many ways, onto our side in this in this equation. Going back to John's question about China and Russia and FATA, the Chinese uh, banking community and regulators want and still wanted to and still want to be perceived as legitimate. And so the fact that um, the Chinese banks themselves were not willing to continue to do business with the North Koreans and certainly would not help in the return of the $25 million. They didn't want to even touch it with a 10-foot pole. That was a, a point of leverage where um, where the Chinese in some ways were being forced on side uh, for, for these purposes. And the third, perhaps most um, interesting part of this is we never dealt with the underlying illicit conduct that was at the core of why we were isolating North Korea to, to begin with. And so we never got the counterfeit plates back for the super notes. Uh, they never agreed to or stopped engaging in drug trafficking. Um, they they didn't stop proliferation. We know, for example, that they were behind the development of the Syrian nuclear program um, uh, that the Israelis bombed. Uh, and so in some ways, we didn't use the leverage not only to full effect in the nuclear negotiation context to get more, uh, but also didn't get at the underlying illicit conduct um, that, that was the driver to begin with. And I think that was a mistake. And I think in some ways, we gave up that leverage too soon uh, because what the North Koreans wanted was access to the banking system again. And in many ways, as we engaged in the diplomatic uh, jujitsu to, to help them, we put the onus on ourselves to help rectify the situation as opposed to putting the onus on the North Koreans and the Chinese to address uh, our underlying concerns. And that's why I think we gave up the leverage too soon. Uh, let me, you know, I know we're, some of the questions that have come in uh, deal with kind of new potential threats with regard to uh, tariff. This is Kieran uh, with regard to terror finance, and they include Bitcoin and virtual currencies. Um, talk about what's Treasury's ability to to track those things, and what kind of a threat do they pose going forward? It's a great question. I, I think um, the the advent of virtual currencies or even bartering relationships, co-ops and those kinds of things that are replacing more traditional value transfer mechanisms uh, creates both law enforcement uh, and regulatory uh, challenges. You've seen the FBI um, talk a lot more about its concerns about the use of Bitcoin potentially by uh, criminal syndicates and organizations, both to hide sort of financial transactions but also to uh, help launder and to settle <clears throat> accounts. Um, I think in some ways harder to do in mass than one would otherwise think, but still a vulnerability. And, and the, the issue of anonymity of, um, of account holders and ability to sort of quickly shift value from account to account uh, without much uh, sort of either regulatory oversight or insight by law enforcement is seen as a vulnerability, and I think I think tactically that's that's right. I think another interesting question with the virtual currencies is, to what extent did they start to replace um, sort of classic currency or classic mechanisms, payment mechanisms, that are are in fact subject to regulation, are well understood um, at least for the most part by regulators and law enforcement, and and how does this alter the way we think about um, uh, the use of these currencies from a regulatory perspective. And I think that's something that, that the Treasury is getting its arms around still uh, and remains remains a question. But I think, you know, the, the, the fundamental question is, can we figure out ways of, um, of ensuring transparency of any new mode of value transfer such that not only can law enforcement get access to information when it needs it, but that we have a sense that there is nothing sort of fundamentally amiss with the vehicle itself that allows criminals or terrorists access to the financial system through a back door. And I think that's really a, a question, at least I haven't settled in my own mind with respect to these uh, 
virtual currencies, but I think it creates enough of a, of a question and a risk uh, that the regulators have to grapple with this pretty, pretty quickly uh, and, uh, uh, and comprehensively. Hey, Juan, uh, based on, um, you know, the, the, the stories about these currencies and about Bitcoin specifically, although obviously they're not the only ones that are most well-known just because of the publicity lately, there's a, certainly a separate question regarding having a parallel uh, currency, if you will. And that, that's obviously a political question. There's one thing to have the Treasury and any regulator try to figure out how to deal with anonymity and how to deal with tracking and, and the use of these um, currencies to, to move illicit funds. But there's obviously a bigger question here. And do you see that getting addressed anytime soon? You know, obviously it's probably bigger than all of us on the call here, but I'm often amazed that when we talk about this, we go to the practical, which you should do. You know, you're talking about, you know, how do you get your arms around it? What are the controls? How do you figure it out? But there's a bigger question here about, um, you know, people, very smart people that have designed these systems, and they're they're dedicated to really being out, out of the traditional banking system. Uh, is that being discussed at higher levels in any of our government or any place else, as, as far as you're aware, or, or think tanks like the one you belong to? Yeah, you you've seen it. You've seen the broader macro uh, sort of issues starting to be addressed. You know, I was at a at a at a payments conference at the Chicago Fed the other day, and um, clearly the Fed is thinking through some of these issues um, in the context of both payment systems and also, frankly, the role of the dollar as the re chief reserve currency and whether or not certain policies, whether they're from the anti-money laundering space or tax transparency or other things are, or these innovations in terms of what's more efficient in terms of virtual currencies or bartering relationships, what they, um, you know, what that means for the U.S. economy, the capital markets, and the role of the dollar. And I think you're starting to see those discussions, but you haven't seen the discussions married anywhere, right. I think, um, in a way that then informs policy kind of at each step of the way. And so in some ways it's seen as kind of a, um, as a, a, a negative externality of some of what we're doing or at least a, a natural part of the environment, the role of the renminbi as a, as a trading currency, the fact that it, it's just going to happen because of the Chinese market and, and Chinese policies. And so in some ways there's a little bit of passivity to it or it's a little bit of a of an ancillary discussion when it comes to specific policy issues. So the 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 simple answer to your question is I don't think there's one place where it's happening at kind of a fundamental level to think through okay what are we doing about preserving the role of the dollar in the global financial and, and commercial markets and how should that inform then our other policies? It's usually kind of the other way uh structured the other way right now i think i think that's obviously a fair point and just would urge all of our participants especially in the aml uh space in terms of compliance to continue to read up and work closely with the regulators and law enforcement but that is something that that intrigues me now some of the questions that have come in uh are specific to your book do you, do you cover the lebanese canadian bank uh issue which you do and you're certainly free to talk about that and uh, HSBC the, with Mexico. I think there's some brief mention there. Uh, by the way, we're going to go to about 10, 10 after the hour to, to catch up on some of the time that, that we missed. But I, I am very interested from where you sit, from doing this most of your professional career, where you see this all going. I mean, we have questions on, you know, what are emerging trends, um, you know, whether the U.S. Uh, can actually uh, fulfill the recommendations of FATF regarding uh, risk the risk-based approach, and I think Kieran and I have our own thoughts on that. But you, toward the end of the book, you talk about what what grabbed me the phrase forced isolation, and how with these laws and regulations, there's been certainly some successes, many successes, frankly. But at some point, I'm not putting words in your mouth, I, what I glean from your analysis is that you think there has to be other other tools or other variations of these tools. Otherwise, at some point, it's like antibiotics. They're not going to work. Can you give us your sense of that? And we're certainly not asking you to opine necessarily on 
the current administration's counterterrorism policies, although they're free to do that. It's more about since we've used sanctions, we've used these tools, going forward, what do you think we need to look at to make sure we continue to be at the front of the line versus at the back of the line? Great question, John. Yeah, I, I, I do think um, in some ways we, we've reached a tipping point um, in how we use these tools and, frankly, what we're demanding of the financial community. And by that I mean uh, the essence of these powers and this influence um, is the, the fact that we want inclusive, an inclusive international financial system that banks – as many people as possible, that provides transparency and accountability for how people are uh, raising or moving money around the world, and that isolates uh, illicit actors that are trying to use the banking system not only to profit, but also to increase their global reach and power, and perhaps even threats to the United States. So that's the essence of it. The challenge, though, is uh, have we reached a point in the system where we have so burdened the private sector in terms of the risk calculus and the reputational impact that we are are forcing uh, what are otherwise legitimate actors to consider not only de-risking but completely uh, doing away with business lines that exits them from key jurisdictions, key populations, uh, key classes of transactions where that void will be filled because money will find a way to flow. It needs to. Uh, but will be filled by less uh, scrupulous actors, uh, maybe alliances of financial rogues that are trying to evade sanctions or scrutiny, uh, or just new technologies that allow people to uh, move money in, in, in novel ways that allow for circumvention of the, of the legitimate financial system and all the controls in it. And so I, I worry about a system that is overburdened, and from a policy perspective, maybe overused at times, because these these tools have been seen as so effective that uh, this is an arena that lies between diplomacy and military power, and on the one hand, people you know don't see sometimes the effects of of diplomacy, and certainly don't want boots on the ground or lobbying of missiles in in uh, in difficult parts of the world, and so we're left with very few few you know real and tangible tools to affect our enemy's behavior in some cases, and, and these are they. And so I just worry about their overuse, the fact that the system relies on the private sector very much to take on the, uh, the risk calculus, and that we're burdening the, the private sector in such a way that there's going to be uh, a negative fallout where uh, private sector actors are just deciding it's not worth it to do certain types of business, and that then has an impact. So one... We've got to have Go a balance ahead. moving forward. I, we have to have a balance. Right, well, I was going to I was going to ask a follow up. Maybe that's where you're going with that. Uh, and that is, I mean, when should we use these, and when shouldn't we use these powers? Uh, I mean, it seems like, you know, you're you're laying out the potential for overuse. And so, what's a good candidate and what's not? Can you think of situations where we probably shouldn't have employed? Uh, Kind of your financial war strategy, your your sanction strategy, uh, and then you know Iran clearly is one that you would say this is a good use of this strategy. But you know how do we know what's a good use and what's not? No, uh, it, it's a very difficult dividing line. And so, you know, as I mentioned in the book, these these are tools that are now used in the context of human rights violations, uh, human trafficking, and and, and other uh, really you know horrendous criminal activity. Uh, and we've we've leveraged the same financial isolation paradigm, or at least tried to, to go after some of these these networks. And I, I think I think that's laudable uh, notionally, but I I wonder if in using these tools, at least the tools I'm talking about that are strategic, uh, like a 311 or a combination of them, uh, includes targeted sanctions and and maybe other isolation uh, uh, sort of financial suasion. Um, you know, maybe those are, are reserved for for not only the the higher end policy concerns like Iran's nuclear program, but very much focused on where it can have the most impact based on both the illicit conduct that's underway and that impacts the financial system, and also uh, 
where it actually can have the greatest impact. That is to say, those actors that are, that truly do need and leverage the formal financial system in a way uh, that allows us to really hurt them and hurt their operations uh, if they're uh, if they're blocked off from that system. And so, I, I think part of this is thinking about how we use these more strategically as opposed to how many times can we use these tools. And uh, the, the more that we do that, I think it, it reinforces their effectiveness because the more that they're seen as conduct-based, the more that they're seen as tied to things that the financial community and sectors really should care about and can figure out um, versus things that are certainly bad and certainly need policy attention, but may not be in the heartland of what banks or non-bank financial institutions can actually figure out through their compliance offices. And I think that's, that's where we kind of can maybe reach a, a, a sweet spot, but it's difficult because Congress is involved, policymakers are involved, and they understand that these are effective tools, uh, not foolproof, not silver bullets, but they're effective tools, and they're frankly, in some cases, the only alternative. Um, and I think that's why you've seen a lot of discussion I've gotten a lot of questions uh, after the publication of the book about whether or not we can up the game against um, against Syria using these tools. Now that we've, in essence, taken military action off the table, uh, and we're stuck in a bit of a of a game of cat and mouse on the chemical weapons inspection. So I think I think we've got to be balanced. We've got to be strategic about how we use them, uh, and I think at a certain point we've got to move to a new. Um, a new stage of the anti-money laundering system where information, to John's point about 314, is more aggressively shared within the sector and that we're analyzing it in a way that's effective for both government and the private sector to act together. You um, you know, it, it seems as though you're ta- kind of talking around, too, the importance of um, getting as much consensus both within the U.S. and internationally in using these tools. Um, and, you know, there's sort of an interesting, you know, side thought in your book. You know, obviously, uh, the U.S. is in a position to use these tools because we're the, the, the everything is in the do- done in the dollar um, and because of this, the financial importance of the U.S. Uh, but, what, but it would be a strange twist if these tools would be used against the U.S. and whatever. So I guess that goes to the, the consensus and using them a little bit sparingly. No, that's that's right. Actually, I think one of the interesting th- things and evolutions in this period is the fact that you know people, uh, competitors, enemies, etc., uh, have watched how we've used these tools uh, and certainly understand that we have economic vulnerabilities. You look at the statements from Al Qaeda. Uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri's uh, latest statement. Uh, Zawahiri, as you know, is uh, now running Al Qaeda. Um, he's talking about disruptions to the U.S. economy. Um, you look at uh, how organized crime um, infiltrates, um, and, I, and I imagine we've got some of the great experts on organized crime groups and financing, illicit financing on the call. Um, you know, they leverage the weaknesses in the system, the, the opaqueness in corporate formation or in beneficial ownership to access the financial system. Um, and even in the case of nation states, you have examples of where countries like China and Russia uh, not only view their economic resources as strategic tools, but are in some ways willing to leverage them and use them quite effectively. And I think it's interesting that uh, in 2008 you had uh, the story laid out by Hank Paulson, then Secretary of Treasury, where the Russians approached the Chinese to dump their holdings of Fannie and Freddie to undermine the U.S. market at a critical time uh, in the faith and confidence in the U.S. system. The Chinese didn't go along with it, but it's a reflection of the Russians thinking about this and the debate in China about the use of unilateral sanctions, something you would have never seen uh, in Chinese discourse, has started to emerge in part because we've taught them the lessons of how to use these tools, and they also understand that we have deep vulnerabilities given our uh, reliance on the globalized financial system, the Internet, supply chains, uh, et cetera. Juan, you know, one of the things, too, that for our audience is so critical that I think they kind of love are some guidance and some typologies um, about, you know, adaptations in the funding of terrorism. Um, as we kind of look towards the, the door here uh, on this webinar, what, what can, can you uh, lead us into some things come to mind that are, you know, trends and new adaptations in uh, financing terrorism? <laughs> 
Sure. I, I think this is this is an interesting space to watch because I think we we reached a, a lull uh, over the last few years where, um, in some ways, we I think had a handle on um, how how many of the groups are raising or moving funds. Did a fairly good job of deterring some of it, disrupting some of it, dismantling some of it. Um, but I think what you see now uh, is a twofold trend. One is that groups have learned to be more creative in their own locality, to leverage uh, opportunities, whether they're criminal or otherwise, uh, to benefit their organizations. And so just as Al-Qaeda has operationally splintered and uh, gone uh, to a more regional or franchise model, so too it has gone to a more localized and regionalized fundraising model. And so with Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb in North Africa, you've got the kidnap for ransom problem uh, and the smuggling issues. Uh, in Somalia with al-Shabaab, you have the taxes that they, uh, that they issue, that they run, uh, what they used to run at the port of Kismayo in terms of port fees uh, and taxes, uh, the charcoal and sugar trade as part of a trade-based money laundering system. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at... Um, some of the groups, of, even including Al Qaeda in Iraq, is it's oil smuggling and bank robberies, um, and you know, uh, so so these these groups and, and groups around the world, and you look at some JI cases where um, they've used mobile banking to move money. They, they've they've understood that they need to adapt and to use the the means that they have to raise money locally, which creates challenges in terms of the use of some of these same tools to to get at. These, these actions, but it also creates opportunities because the more that these actors are engaged in criminality or criminal-like activities to raise money, Hezbollah, for example, with the uh, money laundering operation involving the used car lots in the U.S., the Lebanese Canadian Bank, uh, the drug trafficking, that in some ways exposes them to other authorities and powers and attention from law enforcement, intelligence, and diplomats, and that creates vulnerabilities for them. But I think that's that's one trend. The the other is one I referred to earlier, which is Syria and the the festering conflict there, which in some ways is allowing the rebirth of some of the the more traditional Sunni extremist funding networks uh, that have come out of the Gulf or North Africa to parallel the foreign fighter flows that have come into into Syria, and that is, of course is countered by the flow of money from Iran into Syria, uh, which literally comes in plane loads uh, of cash to support the Assad regime. And so I think um, the terrorist financing space is, is fascinating to watch because uh, the adaptations of these groups strategically and operationally is matched by their innovations in terms of financing. And a lot of these things are not new uh, in terms of ties to drug trafficking organizations, tied to, ties to money laundering operations. But I think they've gotten smarter about it, and I think they're using, in some cases, new technologies to wit the Twitter um, donations uh, to the Syrian rebels and the use of mobile banking in places like the Philippines to support uh, militant Islamic groups. Hey, Juan, what I'd like to do is end on a, on a somewhat strong and optimistic note. One of the things you talked about in your book, and one of the first times uh, I worked with you in, in my previous role at the Bankers Association was when you came up with a concept that I know while we kidded you about the name certainly made a lot of sense, you've talked throughout the book about working with the private sector. Our organization, ACAMS, is founded on that, private-public sector partnership. But you had a concept that you called the buddy bank concept. Um, let's talk a little bit about that because I still think it can work in 2013 beyond terrorist financing, frankly, can be all sorts of forms of dealing with corruption, which we know is a major, major issue for AML professionals, financial crime. But give us a sense of what your thought process was regarding that and maybe some uh, a little a, a plug for that concept going forward. Well, John, first of all, I thank you for remembering it. And uh, I did get badgered and chided quite a bit about <laughs> the name because we had the Bad Bank Initiative underway and we had the Buddy Bank is Initiative underway. Uh, the Buddy Bank um, Initiative was really conceived of uh, as a way of reinforcing uh, legitimate financial behavior in a way that could reward the private sector. That is to say, we had the stick in terms of the bad bank initiative. This was the carrot. And the carrot is that there are uh, 
there should be rewards uh, for those institutions uh, that are committing to financial integrity and compliance as a core part of their uh, the safety and soundness of their institutions. And so fundamentally, that was sort of at the core of what what we were thinking about in terms of the Buddy Bank Initiative. Operationally, what we were thinking was what can happen here and what should happen eventually is that institutions themselves should be sharing information, um, should be sharing uh, best practices, uh, modes of operation. And in particular, when you have very sophisticated major banks uh, doing business in jurisdictions where there are mid sized or smaller banks that form part of the financial system and also need to be uh, secure and legitimate, but may not have the experience or the resources or the experts to bring to bear, that the, the bigger banks could devote at least some time and energy to thinking about uh, mentoring or Im- helping improve um, uh, sort of counterparts in the industry not to not to create sort of competitors or to undercut uh, comparative advantage, but to really think of the system as a, a good unto itself that needs to be defended and that needs to be cooperatively um, uh, sort of protected by the banks themselves. And so that was the idea behind the initiative. And um, in some ways that gave birth to some of the private sector dialogues with regional banking organizations that emerged uh, so I went to Guatemala and gave a speech to Feliban uh, talking about the Buddy Bank Initiative. Uh, the Feliban liked it a lot. You had the Arab bankers taking this on in, in some ways. And, and so you've had the private sector dialogues emerge, which is a component of this. But I think the broader question is, can we think of the system as a collective good and utility unto itself, where we can, both as a private sector and as the public sector, work together to raise the level of compliance and financial integrity so that the system itself is more secure and so that uh, there are no weak links in the system or Juan, less of them. Right. Well, Juan, I want to, on behalf of Kieran and I and, and the ACAMS community, really appreciate you taking the time today. I want to remind folks that Juan will be our keynote speaker uh, at the Hollywood Conference in March. Uh, and also, he and I sat down earlier this year uh, for a podcast that's available on our website. I think uh, this is must-read for anybody in the uh, profession that needs to know not just where we've been, but what's next. And so I think that's what's so important here. And obviously you're staying engaged in the field. So I just want to say, again, on behalf of all of us, we really appreciate the time you've taken with us today. John, Karen, I can't thank uh, you guys enough, Todd, and everyone who joined us um, you know, this was uh, the book was a labor of love. I hope people enjoy it and get something out of it. Uh, but th- these issues are critical to our national security and to our financial integrity. Uh, and to the extent that uh, the professionals who are involved with ACAMS uh, are focused on these issues, uh, I hope the book is helpful. And I really commend this field to, to everybody because, as you know, it's fruitful and it's uh, it's important. Right, thanks, Juan. And uh, Todd, I'll turn it back to you to close the conference. Oh, sorry, Karen, go ahead. No, no, just thank you. Thank you, Karen. Todd, back I was to just going to add that. I was just going to add that this morning, John Byrne made the comment that once we get Juan talking, that two hours is going to fly by. And uh, even though my job is to watch the clock, I looked up at one point and went, "Wow, the time is gone." Uh, we had lots and lots of questions come in. Certainly more than could be answered. So as uh, John mentioned, the conference coming up. I'll put the slide up in a second with that code so you can get a discount. If in the meantime you have additional questions for today's experts or any feedback and suggestions for future web seminars, please send it to the address you see there on the screen. It's training at acams.org.